Welcome to Unlocking Science. Our goal is to glorify God by studying and unlocking the secrets of His amazing creation. I'm your host, Mr. P, and I'm joined again today by Dr. David Minton, and you're going to talk to us a little bit more about muscles. Muscles. All right. We did an in-depth episode, episode where we talked about muscles, a lot of the details of that, uh, how they make our body work, so we'll refresh you on a few of those things. But today's one of our hands-on episodes, and we're going to have a hands-on activity for you. So you'll find a link in the description of this video that'll take you to our Unlocking Science page where you can download a PDF of the experiments we're going to talk about later. So when I think about muscles, there are lots of different muscles in our bodies. If we didn't have muscles, we probably <laughs> wouldn't be able to do much. We'd just kind of sit there because muscles are the main things that help us move our bodies all over the place. But as we talked about in the episode, there are more than one type of muscle. What are the three basic types of muscle that we have in our bodies? Well, of course, the largest muscle in our body is called skeletal muscle. And it's attached everywhere that uh, uh, all the bones of the body are able to move because skeletal muscle has to go across the joint. Yeah. And if you think of it, if muscle doesn't cross the joint, nothing's moving. It doesn't move. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, skeletal muscle, uh, muscles of our body, However, not all skeletal muscle is attached to skeleton. Uh, we have about 45 skeletal muscles in the skin of our face that we use for facial expression. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting that that particular language of facial expression is universal. You can go anywhere in the world and smiles are pretty much smiles and frowns are frowns and anger is anger. Yes. So, um, but most of our skeletal muscle do indeed attach to, uh, to bones and move our body. And then there's another kind of muscle that kind of comes second in quantity. Mm -hmm. It's called smooth muscle. And uh, it's called smooth muscle because skeletal muscle has bands in it when you look at it under the microscope. Yes. Uh, but smooth muscle doesn't have those bands, so they call it smooth. <laughs> That's an incredible way to describe it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and smooth muscle is normally also involuntary. So we don't have to think about it. We normally have to think about skeletal muscle, although there's so many automatic things we do with our muscles when we walk. Could we possibly be thinking of all of the muscles involved in making nope, our steps? You know, and the, in a reflex response, if something's coming at your face, you right. automatically do that. So that's kind of an involuntary and response. And then we talked about breathing in another session uh, mm -hmm. where our breathing is entirely done with skeletal voluntary muscle and yet, how often do we think about it? It's or when just, you're sleeping, you don't have to think about breathing. It's just absolutely. Really so we do have an area in our brain that uh, triggers that breathing and keeps it going, even when we're not thinking about it. But yeah. if we want to take over, we can, of course, do that. Uh, smooth muscles also found around most of the big tubes in our body. You think of the whole GI tract from the oral cavity through. And about 20 feet altogether, 18 to 20 feet. And it has smooth muscle all the way. Yep. It has an inner ring of smooth muscle and then an outer longitudinal smooth muscle. And those two take turns contracting. We call it peristaltic contraction. Mm -hmm. It moves food through our body. Yep. So smooth muscle aids in digestion. So if you uh, think about the esophagus, as you swallow food, your esophagus has those muscles around and it's squeezing that food down into your stomach. It just doesn't yeah. fall down there. The esophagus is an interesting example. When you put food in your mouth, you are a decision maker for the first third. <laughs> yes. Do you want to swallow or not? Okay. Guess what kind of muscle we have there? Voluntary. Skeletal muscle, because we have voluntary control. Mm -hmm it starts switching over into smooth muscle as we go down our esophagus. In the middle, there's kind of a mixture. We pretty well lost control. <laughs> and then in the lower third of the esophagus, of course, it's all smooth muscle. So once we swallow just so far, the smooth muscle takes, takes over. over. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the tubes of the body, uh, hair follicles, smooth muscle raises mm -hmm. those. Uh, uh, blood vessels have to have smooth muscle to control the flow rate of blood that's going through it. Yep. Uh, so lots and lots of smooth muscle in our body. Uh, the muscles we use to adjust the pupils of our eyes mm -hmm. are smooth muscle. Uh, the muscles we use to focus our lens are smooth, whereas the muscles we use to aim our eyes up and down and left and right, those are skeletal. Those are skeletal. Mm -hmm. So there's extrinsic muscles that are skeletal in the eye and intrinsic ones inside that are smooth. Mm -hmm. So we've got skeletal and smooth. smooth. And the third, the third is, is uh, very unique muscles only found in one place in your body. 
and that's the heart. Mm -hmm. And it's called cardiac muscle. It sort of looks like skeletal muscle in that it is banded, okay? But it differs from skeletal muscle in some really interesting ways. One of which is it doesn't require any motor nerves necessarily to contract. It can contract on its own little drummer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, another interesting thing about skeletal muscle is that uh, it cardiac branches. Muscle. I'm sorry, cardiac. It, it's a branching muscle. Uh -huh where skeletal muscles just tend to be long, long fibers, fibers. Uh, cardiac muscle branches into one another, into a, the other cells. Uh, another thing about uh, cardiac muscle, it's like smooth muscle in the sense that it normally has just one nucleus per cell. Occasionally in cardiac muscle, two, but usually one nucleus per cell. You might wonder about skeletal muscle. It's you can different. have a hundred or more <laughs> nuclei in one skeletal muscle cell. Mm -hmm. And that's because skeletal muscle is formed by the fusion of a lot of separate cells that had only one nucleus. Yep. Mm -hmm. But as they fuse, they become a big multinucleated cell. Mm -hmm. So skeletal muscle cells can be very large. Yeah. In fact, they can be large enough to be seen with the eye. They can be several inches long and uh, kind of near the limit of resolution and width. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna be doing an activity today, I'll show, show you that in a few minutes about muscle fatigue. Now, do you think we ever get fatigue in our heart muscle? <laughs> we better not. We better not because it's got to keep that pumping rhythm going all the time or you would die because the blood wouldn't be circulating to get oxygen around your body. So cardiac muscle doesn't fatigue. What about smooth muscle? Does it tend to fatigue very easily? No, it doesn't. In fact, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you want to see the Lord's handiwork, you only have to look at the eyelid. <laughs> We have a muscle that closes the eye, of course, the eyelid, mm -hmm. and that's a sphincter that goes around in a circle like this, okay? They call it the orbicularis, it means an orbit, yeah. oculi, the orbit around orbit the, eye. the eye. When that contracts, your eyes close. Uh, the lower lid doesn't do too much of the moving, the upper lid does most of the moving. But we have a muscle that lifts our upper lid, the skeletal muscle called the levator palpebris superioris. Say that backwards four times. But here's what's interesting. If that were the end of the story, the Lord says, well, I gave you a levator palpebra. You just go around winking at folks or looking at whatever you want to do. You get, you're in control. What would happen is sooner or later, it would fatigue the very thing we're going to experiment on. Because it's a skeletal Because muscle. it's a skeletal muscle. And while skeletal muscle is good for voluntary control, if I want to pick something up, I can do that. Uh, it has a great deal of power. Mm -hmm. uh, but it fatigues. And it, it, it isn't able to even to do this. That doesn't look like much, does it? It doesn't. But how many minutes do you think I'd be able to <laughs> stand here? Probably not very long. <laughs> Sooner or later, this would have to go down. And the Lord knows we don't want our eyelid going down just because the muscle's fatiguing on our eyebrow lifter. Let's okay. say we were driving down the road. We want that thing to be able to stay open for a long so time. So this is, this is nice. Two muscles to each eyelid. One's a skeletal muscle, the levator. The other is a smooth muscle. It's been given different names, Mueller's muscle. Mm -hmm. And the, both of them tie into the lid. And uh, the smooth muscle holds the lid up over the long haul so it doesn't fatigue. And the skeletal muscle is for moving in a voluntary way. People who have a dysfunctional smooth muscle to the eyelid get eye, eyelid droop. Mm -hmm. So you might be talking to them and the eyelid will start coming down. You'll say, hey, your eyelid's coming down. They'll bring it up, but it won't be long and it'll go down again. So that's what life would be like if you didn't have a dual muscle system so on your eyelid. God, God does amazing things that Absolutely. most of us don't even think about or consider, but awesome things that we can learn when we Absolutely. explore our bodies and understand those things more. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about skeletal muscle and why it fatigues. So if you think about skeletal muscle, so if I were to pull up my lab coat here, you can see the, the muscles that would be running up and connecting mm -hmm. into my hand and making my fingers pull. So all these muscles that are moving in through here, up in my forearm, those are all skeletal muscles. So they're pulling and you can see they look like they make these long bands as they're flexing. Mm -hmm. And that's what these skeletal muscles do. They're really a bundle of a bundle of a bundle of little fibers that are spreading out down through my arm. So let's look at this model and talk a little bit about what that individual muscle group looks like. Well, you know, we might start out talking about a piece of ham. Okay. A piece of ham might be uh, an entire muscle from a creature, uh, a pig, I guess. And... Uh, 
if you looked at it, it'd be broken up into little circular fields mm -hmm. in a slice, little white rings around. Yeah. Okay, uh, those are called fascicles, okay? And within each of those fascicles would be hundreds and hundreds of muscle fibers. Yes. And this model represents one muscle fiber and not its whole length, just one cross section. Mm -hmm. If this were to scale and this were to sell a muscle fiber from our leg, it would have to be up through the ceiling up there and down through the floor below yes, to be indeed. scale for this width. Very, very long. So uh, what is one muscle fiber? One muscle fiber is one muscle cell. And, uh, but it's an unusual cell. As we mentioned, it's a cell that has many, many nuclei because it was formed from a lot of separate cells called myotubes that fuse. That fuse together. Mm -hmm. And throughout life, you have little cells called satellite cells just waiting to join in. Uh, if you lift weights, I could rip off my shirt and demonstrate that we'll spare them that. <laughs> if you lifted weights, your muscles get bigger, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason they get bigger is not because you have more muscle cells. They get bigger because the amount of protein in the muscle cells, the myofibrils we call them, that's these little units here that look circular. Yep. These can get more numerous. And uh, so we still have one muscle cell or one muscle fiber, but we have more myofibrils in it. And that causes And that'll expanding. be making it bigger, yeah. right. And uh, the bigger it is, the more myofibrils, the more contractile force it's going to have. Here are the myofibrils in longitudinal section right here. So around this muscle cell or fiber is a layer of connective tissue called the endomysium. And then of course around the whole fascicle was another layer called paramysium. Mm -hmm. And then around the whole ham there was one final wrapping called the epimysium. <laughs> and so here we are looking at one little short segment of a skeletal muscle cell We've cut it off top and bottom, and we've opened it up to look inside. We see the nerve that supplies it, a motor nerve. Uh, it has little layers around it, like insulation on electric wire. It's called myelin nerves. Myelin. And this is the axon coming out. And the axon secretes a, a, a substance called acetylcholine in this case. And what that's going to do is depolarize the membrane uh, of this muscle cell. Uh, through sodium ions, and when that happens, we want to get that signal inside the cell so that all of these fibrils know to contract. Yep. You can't have some of them contracting and some not. <laughs> Muscle fibers, all or nothing. Either the whole thing contracts or it doesn't contract. You know what that means? That means every single muscle cell has at least one nerve. Just for that cell. Just for that cell. And so here it is for this cell right here. And acetylcholine, a chemical substance, will be released. That'll depolarize the membrane, but how do we get the signal inside the cell? I'm glad you asked. Because you see the blue thing here? This is just painted up that way. That's not its natural color. Those are called the T-tubule system. Uh, T stands for transverse because it's going across the Cross. muscle fiber. That depolarization of the membrane follows the T-tubules right through the whole thickness of the cell. And then on either side of the t tube we see this little lacy network that ensheathes each myofibril. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven myofibrils here, each of which is invested. In cell biology, this would call the endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Here they call it the sarcolemma. And notice on each side, the sarcolemma goes up to the t tubule here and here, and we have three tubes together. We call that a triad, named for three tubes. Mm -hmm. And that depolarization causes calcium, which is stored inside of these little hollow vesicles. The terminal cisterni is the part that's against the T-tubule, to release calcium. The calcium then soaks into this myofibril, and that's what causes a contraction. Mm -hmm. No calcium, no muscle contraction. So. Um, that's the contractile mechanism. As I say, it's an alter one response. And uh, what is the nature of contraction? It's all based on what we call a sarcomere. Yes, one little unit, each segment is called a sarcomere. One sarcomere, I better use a pointer here, goes from here to here, from here to here. What would that distance be? This whole cell is obviously a magnified version of its real size. Mm -hmm. 
it's about 10,000 times life size. That's gigantic. This cell, so that. it would be yes. tiny what we're looking at here. And um, it gets its own nerve supply. It has lots of nuclei, that's one of them right there. Yep. But you might have as many as 100 or so, depending on the size of the muscle cell. And um, the way the muscle contracts is because of the sarcomere. Basically, the story is the sarcomere gets shorter. So if this is the sarcomere length from here to here, these two lines called Z lines get closer together. Mm -hmm. And when they do, and lots of others are also getting closer together, there's sarcomere one after another going down the whole length. Yes, the muscle gets together. shorter. And what causes it to get shorter? Well, that's really a complicated story. I kind of have to use this uh, illustration here to help us out here. This is taken with an electron microscope, so it's very high magnification. This is a sarcomere from here to here. Uh, that would be, in life, about two microns. Very, very tiny. Okay, what's two microns like? <laughs> thickness of a dime is a millimeter. Mm -hmm. The thousandth of thickness of a dime is a micron. This is two of them. Yep. Two to three. So if you could slice a dime a thousand times across the... <laughs> this, from across here the to here, this sarcomere would be two to three, depending on the degree of contraction. Mm -hmm. Now notice the center is darker, and the edge going towards the Z line here and here is lighter. We call this the A band. And this lighter band here is called the I band. And the reason this looks so much darker than the I band is there's more protein here, more filaments. This is a model of what explains the sarcomere. Here's the Z line, and there are little thin filaments that attach there. And they're attached in such a way they're staggered from one sarcomere to the next. These are called actin filaments, A-C-T-I-N. They only go just so far, this far. Same over here. These actin filaments come in from this Z line to there. It's all held together uh, by a structure in the middle, so these fibers can't go wandering off. Uh, now notice here are some thicker filaments. We call these myofilaments, and these myofilaments are called myosin. Mm -hmm. It's a different chemical, different protein, and so actin filaments and myosin filaments overlap. Now that's the whole base basis for muscle contraction. Let's say actin filaments, myosin filaments. Mm -hmm. They overlap. You've got some gaps in your fingers there. Right. Those gaps allow this to contract that much. Once I get here, can I contract anymore? That's it. Gonna See, that's a problem with skeletal muscle. It can only contract its sarcomere leg. Yes. Smooth muscle can just keep contracting and contracting. <laughs> just imagine you have a baby and it's all wrapped in smooth muscle, a uterus. You have to sit and squeeze on that to get this baby up. So skeletal muscle would never be up to the task. We call this the sliding filament model. And uh, I think you can see that uh, between the thick and the thin filaments are little crossbars. And these are mechanically active cross bridges. And you have to trust me on this. <laughs> if this is an actin filament, these are myosin filaments, little crossbars between this and this are going like this, pushing this along in and out. So it's the overlapping of a thick myosin and a thin actin with little crossbars here that are very energy demanding for ATP makes that filament slide. And uh, just use your head a little bit here now. If the sarcomere were completely relaxed, it's pulled out as far as it could go. Here is the thick filament, here's the thin. They might overlap, what, that much? What kind of force would we have for contraction right there? Would that be a large force or a small force compared to, say, when it was overlapped this much? Very small when it's open like that. So there is a length uh, contraction relationship in the sarcomere. When it first starts contracting, it has less power. As you get more and more overlap, it gets more power. You can see the power go up on a curve. But then it starts dropping down as the two thin filaments come and meet in the center and start to mash together. In fact, you reach the limit <laughs> when the eye band is totally gone. Yes. And before you even get to that, your, your length tension curve mm -hmm. drops off. So, so it's a bell-shaped curve. If we could take a picture of this when it was contracted, this would all be dark right out here. Maximally contracted, right. Mm -hmm. yep. 
On the other hand, in total relaxation, it could be a little broader than this. Yep. So we're going from about three microns across in a totally relaxed sarcomere uh, to uh, two, less than two. All right, so when we think about those muscles, they're requiring lots of energy. They're requiring calcium and sodium ion exchange, all these things happening back and forth very quickly. And we need to be able to sustain those things for a short amount of times. But those muscles are going to give us lots of power over short duration, but they're not going to be able to last for a long time. Okay? If you've ever had to hold something in your hand very still for a long time, you might notice that after a little while, your muscles might start to tremble or shake. That trembling and shaking is those fibers starting to vibrate back and forth inside <laughs> of there. And they can't quite hold on anymore, and they're just kind of letting go, and they start to tremble, and that we call that fatigue. So what you're going to do in this activity is you're going to test your muscle fatigue. Okay? We've got two different activities for you to try. One, we're going to go with your grip strength. Okay? So earlier, when we did this, we could see that the muscles that squeeze my, that make my fingers close are actually up here in my forearm. There are a couple of muscles in your hand, but the ones that make your fingers contract are actually up here in the forearm. You're going to take this, uh, some kind of a soft ball, like this Nerf ball, and you're going to squeeze it and try and hold it for a few minutes and see how that feels. Then you're going to try something with a little more resistance, maybe a tennis ball or a racket ball, and that will take a lot more force. And if you try to hold both of those for three minutes, we'll see what happens. <laughs> and you're going to try to record when you start to feel those muscles trembling and shaking. Now, you might not be able to squish that tennis ball as much as I can, but you're going to squeeze that one as hard as you can and get it to smash out and see when you start to feel that trembling in your muscles and you're going to record that. Another way that you could do this is you could use some different weights. So these weights, I've got some, one here that's two pounds, one here that's three pounds. You might be able to find some smaller ones or different ones. And you're going to try different weights in, with each of your hands and see how long it takes for your muscles to fatigue. So what you're going to do, you're going to take this weight in your hand, you're going to start your stopwatch, and you're going to lift this up here, and you're going to try and hold it for several minutes, and then try and figure out when that muscle fatigue starts happening, when you start to feel that shaking and trembling. And then you're going to do it with a heavier weight, move up to the three pounds, then maybe do both of them together, but you'll need to rest in between to give your muscles a chance to refresh there. So if you're doing it with another person, maybe I could be recording your time while I'm resting, and then you could record my time back and forth as we're doing that. Now the muscles that we're working here are up in the shoulder area. These are the deltoid muscle. It's called a deltoid muscle across the top of your shoulder because it makes a little triangle. And that's responsible for the abduction, we call this, when you're lifting your arm out like this. So these muscles connect across this joint, and they pull up here on the humerus. There's also another one. I call it the supraspinatus, but Dr. Menton calls it... <laughs> the supraspinatus. <laughs> okay, so I say spinatus, he says spinatus. They're but both it, right. <laughs> <laughs> you can see there's a little spine on your shoulder blade here, the scapula, and if you were to reach around the back of yourself, you could feel that little spine right here across the top of your shoulder. Okay? And the muscle that runs across the top of there is the trapezius, but underneath of that, in this little channel right here, and it comes out underneath of this and attaches here to the humerus. That's also, yep, it runs right through that hole. That also helps to start the initial movement of that, and then your deltoid takes over after about 15 or 20 degrees. So these muscles right here are gonna be all that's holding that weight up, okay? And you're gonna be focusing those muscles. You can see how long they take to fatigue. How many minutes you think they're gonna be able to hold five pounds out there? Wow, uh, <laughs> 10 minutes, you think, they could go that long? I, I'd be impressed if somebody could do that, but you're <laughs> going to start feeling that fatigue a bit earlier. Okay, so you're going to be testing out your fatigue capacity with these different weights and using a stopwatch and just some simple things. I hope you have fun with this. Maybe you can turn it into a little family competition and see who can hold that weight up there for the longest amount of time. And just marvel at the way God, is, God has made our bodies with these different types of muscles, and we can give him all the praise and thanks for this. And until we see you next time, get out and enjoy all of God's amazing creation.